Are you an overwhelmed SaaS founder ready to make the leap from leading a team to leading an organization? Join us each week as we refill your think tank with actionable tips and strategies from great business minds you know and those you don't know yet. This is SaaS Fuel with your host, five-time entrepreneur, SaaS founder, and globetrotting adventurer, Jeff Maines. Welcome back to the SaaS Fuel podcast, where if at first you don't succeed, then skydiving probably isn't for you. I'm your host, Jeff Maines. I help B2B SaaS founders like you profitably scale from seven to eight figures, creating premium valuation, impacting the community, and transforming from engaged operator to empowered owner. And like expert skydivers, we deep dive into the minds of leaders, driving growth in the B2B SaaS space, find out what makes them tick and what gets them up in the morning. Recently, a pizza restaurant in New Zealand made headlines for offering a special deal called a Netflix and Chill, where customers could order a large pizza garlic bread and a chili two liter bottle of Coke, all for the price of a Netflix subscription. Sounds like a pretty good deal. Uh, the offer, you know, as you can imagine, went viral on social media with so many people praising the clever marketing strategy. But, you know, Netflix wasn't too thrilled about it. They sent a, a cease and desist letter to the pizza chain. You know, their brand name was being used without permission. And uh, you can chill, but you can't Netflix while you do it, I suppose. And uh, in the end, the pizza changed the name of the deal to uh, Movie and Munch. But the clever marketing ploy had already made its mark. A great example of the ingenious ways businesses can stand out in a crowded market. Think about all the pizza places. This is one that definitely made some headlines. Now, all it takes is one viral social media launch, and that was it. That pizza restaurant knew their customers would be avid Netflix junkies, and probably a lot of us are, and they capitalized on the opportunity. So knowing your customer base is exactly what our SaaS founder today is a world-leading expert in. When we understand our customers well, communicate directly to their wants and needs, we all win. Well, today's episode is sponsored by SaaS Open. Join 1,000 plus SaaS leaders, get an inside look at the future of software, and spend time with the people making it happen. There'll be five stages with valuable content delivered in short 20-minute segments. It's built for SaaS founder CMOs, heads of product, sales, and engineering. Best way to predict the future is to create it. So come do that with us March 16th and 17th in New York City. I'll be there. The team will be there. We'd love to meet you. And actually, our guest today is going to be a speaker there at SAS Open as well. So you can come meet Drew. Get full details at sasopen.com. In our SAS Fuel Expert Series last week, we had guest Sarah Hawley, founder and CEO of Grow Motely. Remote work unlocked explosive growth for her companies. And now she and Grow Motley do the same for thousands of other companies. You know, I love Sarah's commitment to use her company to improve the lives of those around her and make the world a better place. Fantastic conversation. And our SaaS founder last week was Nathan Miller, founder and CEO of Rent Tech Direct. Nathan SaaS started as a passion project to solve his own real estate needs and quickly grew to be a giant in the space, serving more than 25,000 landlords. Outstanding insights with Nathan and how he built that company. If you missed either one, go back and catch up. Super conversations. My guest this week is Drew Diagostino, founder and CEO of Crystal, a SaaS company that provides personality AI technology to help business better understand and communicate with their prospects and customers. Featured on CNN, MIT Technology Review, Wired, and The Guardian, his app uses cutting AI technology to understand the way consumers communicate, how they behave, and what motivates them to click purchase, right? Welcome a guy who has been helping to shape the future of communication and relationships in the digital age, Drew Diagostino. Hey, Drew, welcome to SaaS Fuel. Thanks, Jeff. Well, tell me a little bit about Crystal and, and how you came up with the idea. Well, yeah, this, it's been a journey. So Crystal is about seven and a half years old since our launch in, in March of 2015. Back then, it was a really gener general personality platform. We offered this pretty new way to analyze like LinkedIn profiles and resumes to detect a disk type or disk profile for someone. And then ever since then, this has been a real exploration of like based on how people have been using our product 
what is that most valuable for? And what we've discovered ultimately is that after a lot of different use cases and a lot of different customers, um, Crystal is most useful for what we call adaptive selling. It's the idea I of understanding, yeah, it's, it's understanding unique needs and preferences of your customer or your buyer and um, adapting the sales process or the message to them. So that's ultimately what Crystal is today. So how do we do that? How do we adapt that message to the, the buyer? The, this is this is an ongoing evolution, but if you think about sure. it, you think about it in these like three, there's three questions you want to. If you think about like an effective pitch for a buyer, and we all we all are pitch things every day. There are these three questions. It's like a who question, a what question, and a how question. So first of all, you want to know who you are speaking with, and who not just in like the factual term, like okay, this is the vice president of you know sales at this company, but more like really who they are as efficiently as you can know that so you don't need to know all the details about them what their dog's name is but know like all right is this person a really direct to the point or is this someone who is more like a storyteller who's going to want to connect with me and that has lots of interesting little quirks that i want to dig into so the who on the high level then you want to know the what it's like what am i pitching this person and your product is one thing but we all have different value propositions so you're, sure. any company might have 20 different value props based on who the customer is. So choosing that one or two value props or the one or two pain points that really best resonate is a really big deal. So figuring out of my product or service, what are these like this handful of value propositions or pain points that I really want to focus on? And then there's the how, which is based mostly on the who, but it's, all right, based on what I know here, Am I going to present this in a very detailed, formal way? Or am I going to be more casual as if I'm text sending a text message to someone? Or is this someone who I really need to be very relational with? So the how is going to be very kind of like gentle, friendly, positive, optimistic. Or is this someone who kind of communicates in business more like a robot where it's like, all right, <laughs> give me the essential details that I need to know. And that's it. So there's the who, the what, and the how. And what Crystal is and where we're kind of taking the product is um, it's all about answering those three questions really well and really efficiently so that every rep um, has the best chance with the pitch they're about to make, whether that's an email, a phone call, or, or a meeting, or even a group meeting. That makes a lot of sense because personalities are different. Some people mm -hmm. want to be communicated with in, in one way and some people you know, really like... They, we just have different styles. So mm -hmm. how does Crystal know how that works? What what is the magic? <laughs> it's not really much. Or magic. is it magic? We, no, it's um. <laughs> so there's like I like to think of it as like three core underlying technologies in Crystal, and they okay. all kind of combine to create this this one experience. Um, the first one is to detect personality types. So for that, we have built over years of time, we built this really big personality test, like free personality test platform, and lots of people fill this out and. When we do that, we collect lots of different variables of data. So we know, for example, based on job title, what's the likely personality traits associated with particular job titles. So if you fill out um, your job title as a vice president of sales, that's going to have different personality traits associated with it if you fill out your job title as a therapist. And we, we've validated those across jobs, interests, skills, word usage, writing style, all kinds of different traits. Different signals that you can pick up so that's the that's at the core of that and then we can we can take that predictive model and apply it to linkedin profiles or resumes or just general text that's written and pick up a uh, personality uh, so that's that's like the detection side if you think about it as a human okay. that's like the process of figuring out okay what's this person like there's that data is useful but it really is only truly like valuable in an ongoing way if you actually use it and you put it into practice in your communication so the next, um, there's the, the other two underlying technologies of Crystal. It's what I call our, our suggestion engine and our, and, our, and our insights engine. So the suggestion engine is what works in Gmail. Most, mostly this is in written communication where because this is a very, call it a direct person and you write a phrase that is very indirect or it's very passive or it's a little too soft. Like, um, it would be great if we could schedule a phone call this Saturday. 
Crystal has an, has like a, it's partially grammar, it's partially tone, partially style. And it will tell you rather than it would be great to schedule a call this Saturday, you should say, can you speak this Saturday? So something much more direct. Um, so that's the suggestion engine. And that's where our emails really tools are really built on. Then there's the insights engine, which is a lot softer. It's not going to say like translate X into Y. It's more based on your intent. So I need to negotiate with this person. I need to negotiate pricing with someone who's very, who's an SC. So they're relational, but also very formal. Crystal's insights engine won't tell you specifically what to say. Plus that would take the humanity out of it. Crystal's insight engine is more giving you these helpful tips along the way and saying, okay. All right, because this person is very formal, make sure that you start off your negotiation with a very clear outline of expectations. And here, here's like a template that you can use or um, because they're very relational before you get into business, make sure that they trust you and make sure that you can, you can use social proof. You can use appeals to authority. There's like examples of what you can do. So it's more of like a training mechanism as opposed to just directly saying, here's what you should do. So those are the three underlying technologies of Crystal. It's the detection, the suggestions, and the insights. Um, and that's where we built this company, this company on really. And we're kind of continually improving those and trying to make them more and more useful. That's really helpful because that, that's when your prospect, you know, gets that communication and and they they connect with you because they they feel like you get them, mm-hmm. you know, because it just really resonates with them. It's how they want to work. It's how they want to communicate. It just fits their style, which is is really unique, I think, in the marketplace and builds that level of trust. So, how did you find product market fits? I mean, you said you looked at a number of different places. How do you know? You know, how did you know where to focus as a company? Uh, we still don't have a product market fit exactly. <laughs> um, and I don't say that just joking. We have product, we have semblances of product market fit in a few different markets. Um, it's been an ongoing journey. So Crystal was focused on like four different markets before. There's sales, training, hiring, and then kind of like this consumer personality okay. market. <laughs> I'll spare you the details. Basically, after bouncing around for years and building a lot of features and a lot of tools and getting a lot of feature bloat and realizing that we had kind of spread ourselves thin, we ultimately refocused over the last two years and realized our bread and butter is in B2B sales organizations. These are the companies that are, if you dug into our thousands of customers, the ones that were paying us the most, that were being retained for the longest, and who were expanding their accounts. Like when they would get, they would just add more seats routinely. And the other markets weren't really doing that. We had very high churn in the other markets and very kind of flaky usage patterns. And it's, you could very clearly see that this was, this was creating value in sales that it was not creating in, in other markets and other industries. So we dove in headfirst into that vertical. And there are still lots of legacy customers in Crystal user for all kinds of things. But ever since we focused on sales, we started going up market with our we kind of moved away from self-service pricing and more towards like B2B team subscriptions. And we adopted this whole position of the adaptive selling platform. So not focused on the personality per se, but seeing personality as a vehicle for having like empathy in your sales process. That's the, that's the change. So it, it really impacted our positioning and our business model. But now when you say product market fit, I see this a couple different things. Like, Yes, we have product market fit in the sense that we know who our we know who our ideal customer profile is, and I could pretty confidently say that if we get in front of the right people at an organization, we can make a very compelling case to to buy Crystal. But we don't have product market fit in the sense to where it's still not a no brainer for a, a sales team, and I, and I say that because a lot of sales teams aren't yet at the point of like optimizing the content in their communication. The forward-thinking ones are. Many sales teams are still struggling with process problems. So you see a lot of the B2B software investments they have, they're all about sales process and forecasting. And like getting those things right. The ones who really find value in Crystal are the ones who are investing heavily in like training and focused on not just the numbers game, but really focused on um, the effectiveness of their sales reps in email and on the phone, etc. So I think that's that's yeah. really helpful is yeah. to focus there. I mean, because you can have tools and, and measure, and, and I don't believe that sales is a numbers game. 
Mm-hmm. I think you waste a lot of leads, uh, a lot of good connections by by playing it that way, rather than really trying to match um, the the style, match the personality. You know, get your salespeople trained up to where that they're you know being much more effective than mm-hmm. just uh, you know throwing a whole bunch of stuff out there. And I mean, that's kind of the old way of selling. Yeah, I think is a shotgun. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely. I mean, but it's old way, but it's only amplifying more. I mean, I'm seeing sure. more and more products that use like AI in their title to where the whole goal is to send more emails and to do quote unquote personalization, which really just means aggregating some data set and inputting little um, variables in an email. Plugging in variables. Say, yeah. Right. And it's, it's basically, um, it creates a dilution of the entire medium of email and LinkedIn messages to the point where it's sure. just, it's ridiculous. Like you, you, why ever pay attention? Um, right. And it's kind of a shame. More quantity it, is not more quality. <laughs> yeah. So ultimately what I've been trying to hope, I have been questioning this too, because we use the word AI with, when we talk about crystal as well, like personality sure. AI. What we're really talking about is our detection, like detecting how personality works. It is, it is machine learning and it's, it's a, we definitely use AI techniques, but I actually, as far as like using this for emails, I almost position it as like anti AI. It's more trying to help inject more empathy and and humanness into the communication because it's, it forces you to think. When Crystal says, "Hey," it, like in our email tool, for example, Crystal will highlight a thing and tell you like this doesn't sound right for a for a D type. You should be more direct. Sometimes it'll give you an answer that says like you should replace it with this. Oftentimes it'll say you should do something like this and it's training you. It's like nudging you. It's kind of like having your, your, your VP over your shoulder saying like, you should write something like this instead. So it's, it's making the rep better over time and making them think about the recipient of the email or their customer who's going to be on the phone. So the way I see it is like, as AI makes email inboxes and LinkedIn inboxes more inundated with a lot of the content that kind of sounds the same. The reps who are really good at communicating and connecting on a human level and who can, who know how to separate out themselves from all the bots. I think that's going to, I think that signal will cut through the noise. So I'm trying to position crystal in a way that's like the more technology infiltrates human communication, the more of an advantage it is to be a real human writing something. Um, so that's at least where I'm putting my eggs and I'm trying to trying to encourage that with our sales team as well. I think that's a good place because the, the human element is something that can get lost very easily in just doing some, you mm-hmm. know, tags that are replaced with, you know, it, it, it's pretty obvious a lot of times when you get one of mm-hmm. those personalized emails and uh, and it's the personalization is just not quite. You can tell. It's quite just, there. Yeah. You can it's tell. Just, yeah. 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 So having that human factor in there, and especially empathy, is something that uh, machines will never be able to to do themselves. And so just empowering the salespeople to do that well, I think, is really powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are certain things that salespeople that humans can do that are, are always going to be really difficult for computers to do. Um, they, it's funny. It's like almost. It's almost like they're the computer science part of me kind of knows these problems. So therefore, when I see an email, I kind of can pick up on the little things. One of these is computers do humor very badly. Yes. It's, a, it's, it's like a, it's a <laughs> well-known computer science problem that detecting sarcasm is one of the hardest problems of natural language processing. Like detecting sarcasm is, is almost impossible for computers to do. Right. And right. And because I think is, it's literal. Yeah, yeah. As is writing sarcasm, <laughs> writing sarcasm is very hard. So sarcasm is typically viewed as like, rude in a sales context but when you're thinking about you be competing with a lot of um algorithms and i even saw like there was a company uh jasper that just like raised all this money um it's a pretty cool product they used, i think they use gpt3 to to write headlines and i was just thinking or write articles and stuff and thinking wow i mean that's an amazingly powerful technology it's gonna be very cool but what happens when like all the marketers are doing that and they're all and I don't, I don't know, I don't know the company, I don't know the, the founders, but it's like a very interesting philosophical question. Like, even if the product works really well, what happens when all this stuff converges and it ultimately reduces the value of, of real writing down to zero? And and that's just really interesting. And it's like, well, all of a sudden, there are certain things that humans do that computers can't that will stand out. And I think sarcasm is one of those things. 
general humor, like being able to make a joke that's actually funny, is hard for a computer to do. Yes. It's not easy for a human to do, but it, at least we, we stand yeah. a chance. Um, <laughs> Sometimes. Those little things you pick up on, the little personalization, not like, I see that you are X title at X company and you're interested in blank, but being able to actually create a human connection via like a mutual contact or something from your past that you bring up or, you know, something that clearly came from a a human. Um, Another one is mistakes, like very human errors that that come in um, or acknowledging a mistake saying, I think it might be this, but I'm not sure about this. Acknowledging your flaws is actually something computers don't really do. It's something that humans do. Um, so I think there's like a lots of these little cues. I, this is just something that's been on my mind this week while I've been, I've been looking at a lot of the rise of these like AI content creation type tools. I like that. So it's definitely a yeah. different approach to sales. And how does personality play into that? You know, what are the, the different personality types that you're you're looking yeah. for? Uh, is it all specifically role based, or how do you handle you know outliers? So when you talk about personality, it's very it's a this is this like spectrum of opinions on it. And so it's just, I have fallen different places on that spectrum ever since Star Crystal. So for the last eight years, I've been wrestling with this. There's one end of the spectrum which says all personality stuff is like totally BS. This is horoscopes. Right. It's a pseudoscience. It just is all confirmation bias. There is no utility in it. It's fake. And then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is I live and die by what my Enneagram tells me. Or by, you <laughs> right. know, and I put everything up to this kind of, to an almost religious level of like, you know, th- I'm a true believer in this stuff. And the truth about this is somewhere in between because we have, lots of research and literature, particularly on the big five personality traits, which can validate. And we all know this from our interpersonal interactions every day. Personality types are real. Like there, there are very clear patterns of behavior between sure. people. Some people are way more relational than others. Some people are more extroverted. Some people are more introverted. We know this. You know this right. every day. And this is why personality types ring true and why so many people take personality tests. Um, but they cannot attri- you cannot attribute all everything to them <laughs> right so, there's a sweet spot in there where it's all right at what point do these validated differences between people actually become useful in a business interaction and what i found from doing this is that there's a couple of places where that really is an impact one is when you are contacting them cold okay because that is a moment where you've got a very small amount of time to get their attention so it really matters a lot whether you say Hey Jeff, how's it going? Or hi Jeff, I have an important thing for you. Right. Th- that actually matters quite a bit because if you're speaking to Jeff and he's a storyteller, can conversational person, you will connect more if you approach him in that way. If Jeff is a very logical, formal, business-like person, you're just going to completely lose him if you say, "Hey Jeff, how's it going?" It's going to right. It'll come off terribly. So that moment, the cold moment, the cold open is a very important, that's where personality comes into play. Um, Another one is really high stakes or difficult conversations. So this isn't cold. This might be further along in the sales process. But let's say you have to enter into a a tense negotiation um, or a pricing discussion or a some kind of conflict that comes up in the sales process, or you're trying to save something that's not going well. These are hard, high stakes conversations, which you put a lot of thought into. And that's where I actually personally still really lean a lot on disc because it's for those cases, let's say, uh, let's say we're having the pricing discussion. It's a pricing negotiation and it's, it's, it's kind of tense. Um, in that case, I have a very, intentional decision to make am i going to push and be firm and challenge them or am i going to give and be more relational and accommodating in this process so if i'm if i'm approaching an s type which on the disc is since steadiness that's what it stands for but it's, it's associated with behaviors that are more relational and, and slower and steady the more i push on them the more i'm going to alienate chances are if they've given me something if they've given me an idea of their like this is what we can do. It's probably accurate. 
because they're not interested in conflict. They're not trying to get as much as they can out of me. They ch- chances are they're they're giving me the real bottom line, and I should probably give and be a little bit more accommodating, be pretty soft with my language, don't push too hard. If I'm coming into contact with a D, who is l- is pushing for a better price, going in kind of guns blazing, and I know that this is a D, I should stand my ground because chances are they will actually respect me more for it by being more firm and challenging them and pushing back. And if I give too much, A, I'm probably going to not get as good of a deal as I can, but B, I might actually lose their respect because it's they view business as an arena and a challenge and it is a place to challenge and get what you can. I see this all the time when, you know, cause I'm, I'm a D myself. So it's, it's funny. I, I like to negotiate. It's, it's something it's fun for me. So even, even with sales reps who are buying something from who I've got good rapport, I hope none of them are listening to this podcast. Um, <laughs> I will push because I want the, I, I, and I won't be cheap. I, 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 but I will push. It is in the best interest of our, for what's in the best interest of our company. I'll try to get a good deal. And it, you know, it might, it might take a couple back and forths and like really getting pretty direct into the conversation, all like respectful, but you know, it's firm. Sure. And then afterwards, when it's time to do the onboarding call, we close the deal. It'll all, it guard goes down. Everything's like a lot more collaborative and everything. But I just, I've always been this way. I do the same thing at car dealerships and uh, like, I just like the negotiation. It's like a, it's like a fun activity during my day. Some people hate it. They, they would, they will do anything but negotiate. It's like, that's why real estate agents exist. Like some people just hate ne- the negotiation process for a house. Meanwhile, I'm like, I, I love that. I-, I love the whole. So, um, yeah, knowing that in a hard conversation, personality comes into play big time. Um, so those are the two, area there's a lot more but those are the ones where it's like most acute i think it's like cold when you don't have any idea where you're getting into and when it's high stakes when it's like a difficult hard conversation i like that we're going to take a quick break and when we come back we're going to ask drew about what makes an effective pitch and what components need to be in there what brings people in and what pushes people away right after this today's episode is sponsored by small fish big pond building a world-class business that swims circles around competitors. Why do some companies achieve explosive growth while others sink into the depths? What do exceptional SaaS companies do that mediocre companies don't? What can SaaS leaders learn from fish? Small Fish Big Pond delivers powerful business lessons guaranteed to change the way you view your business and includes hands-on exercises and growth tools to get lightning-fast results. Get your copy today at smallfishbigpond.com. And use the code SASFUEL to unlock special bonus content. Welcome back to SASFUEL. My guest today is Drew Diagostino, founder and CEO of Crystal. And Drew, tell me a little bit about an effective pitch. What makes one pitch effective and what makes another one fall flat? Hmm. This is the thing I've been thinking a lot about, especially as we've kind of repositioned our products for the last two years. Um, And... The key to that question, it sounds like a caveat, is that it totally depends on the person, which I hate that answer, but that's actually... That's a good like, marketing answer. That, that is actually the answer. It really <laughs> does depend on the person. So um, the problem the problem is when you have one pitch that works in one situation, and then you try to adopt that for every other call, and you're wondering, why is this falling flat? Because it, it worked in this one case. Now, the answer is not that everybody needs their own individual pitch. But the answer is that you need a set of pitches that you can then quickly identify which one am I going to. It's kind of like having a toolkit. You don't have, you know, you don't have access to millions of tools, but you've got a few that you can sure. you can hold on to and kind of make your mental notes. And then you know, oh, yeah, I'm in a conversation. This is when I'm bringing up the the story pitch, the where I, they're they're a character and I'm I'm walking them through with this. Or oh, this is when I'm bringing up my data pitch. This is this is when I'm really sticking to just past results, whatever I can prove and validate. Or maybe this is my like elevator pitch. This is someone who has like 10 seconds of attention. I was going to give it to them straight right now. So having that set of pitches is really what you, what you're aiming at. It's what I aim at when I'm on my sales calls. It's like trying to identify what that is. And this is what we use crystal for. I don't want to be too self-serving, but it's like the quickly identifying what, what the pitch for that person is. Um, and then when you dig into that, there's a lot beneath it. Cause if you're making an email pitch, 
there's all these questions like, what's the best opener? Should I start with a warm up statement? Like, I hope things are going well, or, you know, hope you're having a great fourth quarter. Um, or do I start directly with a call to action or, an, or a statement of my intent? So there's a, like an intention statement, which is I'm writing, the, I'm, I'm contacting you because I'm interested in creating a partnership. Or is it a call to action that's like super direct? Hey, Jeff, do you have 10 minutes this week? Because I think we can really create a lot of value. Yeah, it's there's you could break those things down and we talk at length about what makes a great pitch. But I think the, the what's probably more useful is this idea of the tool set and then the idea of building blocks. A great pitch cannot be all pitches are not created equal. You should have a tool set of these pitches and you should really know your building blocks well so that you can you can you can use those when it's necessary. So rather than one pitch, what's my effective call to action? What is my super effective data point that I can bring up in this case? So, yeah. So those are the different building blocks you're talking about. There'd be the data point, the o- the opener, the closer, the call to action, those types of things. Um, well, to be to be more specific with it, we actually in our product we we do we do a lot to try to identify value propositions and pain points. Those those two things. So it's like if you can suss out the pain point, you can meet it with the correct value proposition. Um, Makes sense. And there are. I believe the last count there were, this was from analyzing like thousands and thousands of emails to try to detect uh, pain point statements. So there's about 12 categorizable pain points that most people can lean on and about 12 of the value props. I think if, if I was coaching a new sales rep or coaching a sales team, what I would try to do is I would try to identify these pain, these pain points um, because I can use all of them based on the, based on the, the customer. That's an, these are in no particular order. Um, it's economic pain. So economic pain is an example that would be with some kind of external uncertainty or dealing with some kind of macro trend. Certain high-level people are going to be thinking about that a lot. Others will not. Sure. Um, performance pain. So um, you are not getting everything that you can out of your team right now or you're struggling to grow at the level you want, or you're not meeting your KPIs, or someone is not meeting their KPIs. Performance pain. I have an expectation. I am not meeting it. A hiring pain point, which is, or a team that's a people-oriented pain point. It could be relational as well. So related to not finding the right people in the seats, or simply that the, there's something not working relationally on my team. This bothers a lot of people, whether it's I don't have the right people here, or I'm not. it's not working with the people here. Some people, it's not, it's not exactly as resonant. Timing pain point. So that's something is taking too long. Or if I'm wasting time on something, some people are very sensitive to time. Uh, a strategy pain point. So um, this, this tends to be a pain point for people who are very rigid and very focused on processes. They're really good at the how, but they struggle with the what so or the why. So speaking to that, um, really helps sometimes uh, efficiency pain point, which is pretty obvious. It's like something is too costly. Something is just not, not going smoothly. A, uh, I call this communication pain point where it's more about, um, you can also call that confusion pain point. Things are just unclear. Okay. We help clear it up. Um, growth pain point. I'll a couple more of these uh, growth can be kind of lumped into performance, but it's really more specific to overall growth so performance i would say i have this expectation i'm not meeting it a growth pain point is more just general like you are not we we are not growing as fast and we're trying to grow more the two and then the two the two more are uh actually three three more is a difficulty pain point which is this is hard and and it could be easier a cost pain point very obvious something's too costly could lump that in with efficiency pain point and a security and compliance pain point where um it's more of a risk. I'm at risk right now. And that gives me fear. Therefore, something that can make that fear go away is is really valuable to me. So those are the, 12, like pain, those 12 types of pain points that we've kind of like, after doing a lot of like analyzing of sentences and emails, trying to extract. Um, and we've kind of done the same thing for value props and um, different types of questions and calls to action and stuff like that. 
Oh, that's really, really good. Yeah. And so it would be taking those pain points and then figuring out within your solution, mm -hmm. you know, what what specifically is the pain point my prospect is feeling in that area and how can we address that? Yeah, is literally that having a sheet that just goes down that it's like, all right, well, it seems like this is a person who really values their time. Let me look to my time pain, my time pain point or value proposition that kind of play, you know, together in that way. Um, because depending on your product, most products have some kind of, in that example, have some kind of time element to them where it, you're buying it to save time on something. So especially software products. Right. But it's, it's going to be a different, it's going to be very different from company to company. So being able to really hone in on, all right, how does my software really save time? Because there are certain people where time is their number one priority. Um, so being able to like do that thinking ahead of time and not while you're on the call or writing the email is really the key. Because you could probably think of it on your own beforehand, but doing the prep work is very different than like improvising. Right, right. So if you think about software, maybe they're using, you know, the solution today is Excel spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for one person, time may be uh, you know, a big driver because, that, you know, doing that process takes mm -hmm. a full day where using the software takes 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Where somebody else, it could be performance where it's uh, maybe, you know, tell me if I've got this right. The performance, I'm not seeing the data that I need to make decisions mm -hmm. because it's it's in Excel and, and you know, it's it's not a, a good process. So I'm missing the data that I need. And so that would be a performance pain versus time. So those are two about, completely different pitches. And let's think about a relational person. You might have someone in there that using a spreadsheet is actually a relational tool. It's because they need to share. They need to communicate yeah. with other people. And it's a totally different way to look at it. And it, it all depends on their personality, what role they have, their goals. So I like that. So it's not just role-based. It's not just personality, but it's really the the mm -hmm. the compilation of all of those. Yeah, it's, and so it's you're like, hitting the I, right person with the right message. Yeah, think about it. It's taking all those inputs. And then ultimately, it's not like a random set of inputs. These are all inputs that are trying to guide you towards a question, which I think at the end of the day, the question is what matters most to this person? And if we can detect that, then it really doesn't matter much of like all the skills associated or the charisma or all of the all the strategies. If you're really boiled, if you can if you can do that work ahead of time to figure out what really matters to this person more than anything else, you can do a lot wrong and still make a lot of progress in the sales in the sales process. Because it comes back to empathy. It's mm -hmm. the the human aspect and connecting with them in the yeah. in the way that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I like so. that. I could probably talk for a lot and get the, the nitty gritty specifics, but I feel like the pain points really help kind of like narrow it down best. So what do you think differentiates successful entrepreneurs from those that uh, that kind of struggle? You know, what is that like a competitive ad advantage that uh, that maybe you have in building a company, you know, mm -hmm. that, that is successful? Well, I think every entrepreneur, even the successful ones, spend long periods of time struggling. At least that's what I think. Uh, I think yeah, you're right. I do. <laughs> I think you're yeah, right. So, so it's not like an either or question. If I was to try to sum up an answer to that, I think there's a lot of value to just pure spending time being obsessed with a thing because we're working with limited limited information, and we all have this like upper bound on intelligence. We all have different some different tools in the kit. Like some of us, some of us have higher, you know, uh, capacities for certain things than others. But in general, like we, we're all very limited in our time and our, and our ability to accomplish things and solve problems. So I think where there is a competitive advantage that comes in is like, if one person spends all of their time focusing on a very, very narrow thing, like extremely narrow, they can probably at some point become the best in the world at that thing. Like, and you can, you can, you can take it to some extreme example. Like, um, let's say I spent my entire day. So let's think of someone on the spot. Let's say I spent my entire day, um, walking around my block here in Nashville. And I just spent all my time for like five years walking around this block. I would know more about this square mile than any person in the world. I could tell you the intricate details of everybody's mailbox. I could tell you everybody's patterns of how they go about their day. I could tell you what the dog's names are. I could tell you when the, do when the dogs come out and when they go back in. 
I could tell you where the this what when this person painted their house. I could tell you exactly when these people moved in, when they moved. I would know such intricate details about this block because I spent hours every single day walking around this block. Um, better than anybody in the world. I can confidently tell you. Sure. That. Best person in the world with any information you need to know about this square mile of, of land. Now, that's an extreme example. There's not much commercial value in that. Like, so <laughs> granted, I, you wouldn't really want to do that for a living, just walk around the block. Um, but if you take that and extrapolate out to something a little bit more broad, most people have a thing that they're working on or that they're doing that, that actually does have commercial value that they can get pretty obsessed with and spend lots and lots of time doing that that thing or that combination of things in, in, I can only speak for myself, like in my kind of current example, um, in my little narrow corner of the universe, I think I'm currently actually what I was just going through identifying the specific pieces of a sales email and how to reword those, those pieces of a sales email for different types of people. I have been deep in the weeds of this, going through thousands of sales emails, both manually and with like machine learning techniques, parsing out phrases, phrasing the, the phrase, let me know if you have any questions, figuring out all of the hundred iterations of that phrase and how you can best say, let me know if you have any questions for different types of people. And like, like these little details um, or the amount of times people write the phrase, hope you're doing well. It, it, it's, it's it's insane like <laughs> we've just I'm adopted sure. this as like a natural thing that we do where nobody says that in person but we always say it in email right um there are these nuances to these like emails that i've gotten pretty obsessed with that i could tell you like i just dove into for like years at this point point. and i think that ultimately is playing out into the product where my, my my hope what i'm betting on is that that nuanced understanding of this very specific problem helps us build the best possible um, writing assistant for sales reps who need to write those kinds of emails all the time. Um, so that's an example. And, and I'm kind of hoping that that continues to play out and to create value in our product. But I mean, my dad has the same thing, except he's a, he's a master carpenter and he gets obsessed with little details about fireplace mantles. Um, and he can tell you and ungodly amount about um oh actually a bunch of things in that in that realm um but i will i will never know as much as he does about wood and about how different and about how wood and moldings and heat all interact together and all that it's it's crazy because he's been doing it for years and years and years so i think there's just so much value in the time and the focus and being obsessed with something um that's ten that tends to be my conversation with like either entrepreneurs who are just starting out or or you know, whatever, same stage, earlier stage, it's kind of bringing it back to the idea of like, what's the thing that you're confident that you know more about that, like any than anybody else in the world, even if it's kind of ridiculous and obscure. Um, Because I think that's where the the golden nuggets are a lot of times. I think that's really interesting. And and to me, that's mastery. You think about, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a carpenter, and and you don't start out knowing that, but it's, it's that repetition over time and really, you know, working on your craft. That's where mastery comes from. And I think that's, that's what you're talking about with obsession. So finding that problem, and and that's where results have to come from. When you spend that much time really obsessing over solving a problem for a client, that's where you know you become masterful at at solving that problem. Totally, yeah. What do you think that is for you? What, what would you say you're that you're confident that you know more about anybody, like in the world? What obscure thing? I don't know about obscure, but uh, yeah. you know, growing revenue, building businesses, yeah. and you know, specifically SaaS, there are probably people that that know more than me, you know, about specific areas. But they've just done this, you know, for so long in so mm-hmm. many different industries. Uh, you know, what what works, what doesn't. Uh, you know, mistakes that I've made, yeah, you know, sometimes multiple times. Yeah, I got some, questions, know, those, for those I got some questions for you offline. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I just obsessed with you know what makes people tick. Mm. Uh, you know, background in, in marketing and in psychology. And those two things are, are super powerful in just understanding, you know, why people do the things they do. Why mm-hmm. do they make the decisions? And I think you're, you're a, in, along a lot of those same lines of, you know, how, how is this message going to resonate with somebody? Mm-hmm. I think that's fascinating. 
I definitely have some questions for you on the uh, on the B two B revenue revenue front. Because <laughs> I'm only two years into that, I, I'm, I'm I'm working my way up that learning curve. That's awesome. Well, you know what what role have mentors played in your success? Um, at times, really important. I don't have very long term consistent mentors. I know a few people who do, but I do have men- people who I've considered mentors who have engaged for seasons of time when they've been really close and then maybe gone years where we don't talk much and then all of a sudden something happens and it's it's really close so i would say for at least the way it's played out for me particularly pro- professionally and personally but i mostly as it involves crystal i've got several advisors and investors who have been really important mentors and some of them have just been super involved for like a month when i'm really trying to figure out something um, that makes sense. Or when we're dealing with a tough situation or whatever. It's it's almost like a that network's there. I know I can fall back on them, but it's not like I'm talking to them, checking in all the time. It's more I send out the monthly email. They all read it so they can know what's going on. They have context. But when we really need to dive into something, having someone there who's like a specialist or who's been through something specific, yeah, that's been that's been most helpful. It's like those short term seasons where you need to really lean on someone and then kind of keeping them updated the rest of the time. Do you see that as kind of a normal path of just the, the seasonality? You know, you go through dis- different seasons personally, through different seasons in the business. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I, well, one thing that we we talked about a little bit offline was uh, the idea of like work life balance and and yes, kind of going in different seasons. There's these seasons of life. Well, I guess I'll back up a second. If you ignore the fact that you've got cycles in your business and your personal life, you're you're going to end up burned out and just completely, probably burned out, but then also just uninterested in what you're working on. I think the cyclical nature of things is just like this natural law where you you can't really violate it. You can't try to violate. You, yeah, at your own peril. When it, with regards to like how Crystal has gone through different seasons, it's kind of funny. Where as much as I could like to try us to be really consistent and know exactly where we're going all the time. Realistically, there's just these like unknowns that have bubbled up at times, which have really shifted where the company goes. And then it sends us on a cycle. And I think one thing as CEO that I try to do is make sure that we're very clear about the overall direction. Like this is where we're going and, and this is what we can say no to, but at the same time have openness to when there is momentum or whether there is opportunity allow it to marinate and allow us to allow us to adventure into that. And it might be, a, might be a roundabout waste of time, but it won't be a waste of time if we learn a lot. And it, so balancing between that, like having the really clear direction, but then allowing these like natural cycles to happen and the natural momentum or stuff to pick up. It's kind of a, I don't know, it's been a really, I, I'd say a big learning experience for the last like seven, eight years. But then personally, I mean, the, uh, <laughs> there's a, there's a certainly, uh, seasonality to a lot even me like i this is my second go around as ceo and i i took a i took a year and just had to step back from crystal and learn classical piano for a while um but love that yeah yeah. so how important is it to have you know hobbies you know outside of of work and you know decompress you know do something different Hmm. i'd say for me the Piano is not really a hobby. It's not a career. It's something between a career and a hobby. Um, okay. Yeah, I spend still. So I if, for that for me particularly, I spend currently two to three hours a day on it. I try to wake up early and sometimes I stay up late doing it. But uh, that's fantastic. So it's definitely like a little more than a hobby. Obsession. To, yeah, it's, it's sometimes sometimes it is an obsession. Yeah, but <laughs> I think the. Uh, in the big picture is like the most practical thing that maybe is helpful for other people is that as someone who's like a creative or like an artist who ended up in software throughout my twenties, I was doing tech. I was doing crystal and before crystal I had another software company. And I always had this kind of underlying guilt of like, Hmm, I'm not being creative. I, I am, I'm doing software. I'm doing tech. I'm not, I'm not pursuing music or writing or the things that I kind of know that really light me up. And I ha- had that just simmering for a long time. It, it felt almost guilty. And I'll try to have creative outlets like write on the side or, or write our book or crystal and stuff. But <laughs> it, it was funny. It was like, I didn't actually, it wasn't until I totally committed for like a year 
and didn't just view it as a hobby and said, no, what does it actually look like to like walk away from my business and just do this and just study like eight hours a day, classical piano. And like make some sacrifices in the process of that because I don't think it was necessarily uh, the most like high output thing I could have done. You know, as far as it's like producing revenue or whatever. But for me, what it really did was solidify: a, I know that I can do this. Like it was a thing that I had felt guilty about not pursuing, and, and knowing that I could, I had the capacity in me. But then seeing what that life actually was, and knowing that, oh yeah, I'd, I think I really genuinely enjoy entrepreneurship and software. This is fun. And I get to interact with people, solve problems, work on really hard things. And I'm not sitting in a room by myself playing you know, piano all day. Um, it helped help me realize like the, the right place for that particular, call it a hobby, in my life. And I think, I don't know, people are so different from each other. So I hate like generalizations. I, I do think there are a lot of people who have this simmering thing that is distracting them from their job or distracting them from their business because they think that it's a binary. It's like, I am, <laughs> I don't know, let's use a cooking as an example. I love cooking. Okay. But I, or I, I don't personally love cooking yeah, that yeah, much, but I'm saying if somebody you. did. Um, but I, I'm working, you know, I'm doing this other kind of business. Therefore, I feel like I'm, I'm missing out on the opportunity to be a great cook. And it's a binary thing in your mind. It's like either I'm doing this tech business or I am uh, going to culinary school in Italy and I'm going on, you know, that's it. And I think we create those, those binaries there and they're kind of false binaries. So I think what I've learned from, at least from the piano thing in my life has been, um, I think there's, we can overestimate the amount of time that it takes to really go hard after something that really matters to us. And it not it doesn't necessarily need to come at the expense of um, of business or family or these other really important pillars in life. It's like for me, what it practically meant was, oh, you mean it's an option to pursue the piano seriously by doing this like a couple of hours a day, which is serious. It's a lot of work, right? But right. It's not my, but it's not my life, and and that's qu- quite enough. And I think it's it's sometimes difficult to put things in that perspective, where it's like I could take this thing seriously on the side, without completely leaving everything else. Yeah, um, without it being all consuming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, you like that. Yeah, yeah, I think you, you probably. It seems like you you do that pretty well because you've got you've got multiple multiple things going on. Yeah, try and keep the the pillars yeah. in the right yeah. places. Yeah, yeah, and still have time for music. That's good. Right. Yeah. Well, where can people find out more about you and about Crystal online? Uh, you can find out more about me. Probably, I don't know, I'm on LinkedIn. It's the only social network <laughs> I'm really in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so on, LinkedIn, on LinkedIn, Drew D'Agostino and um, Crystal's crystalnose.com. Um, you, can, you can go on and fill out personality tests for free. You can use our personality prediction tools in LinkedIn and Gmail and Outlook. There's like free trials of those. So it's a lot you can, it's a lot you can do on it. Fantastic. And we'll make sure and link all of those in the, the show notes, including the the access to the, the personality profiles and the, the trials as well. Mm-hmm. So there's something that, uh, that everybody should be using to increase their B2B sales and get the right message to the right person at the right time. Sounds good. Thanks, Jeff. So it was a great conversation. Really enjoyed talking with you, Drew. Me too. Thanks again to Drew for coming on the show and sharing your journey and insights. You know, I didn't mention it, but did you know that Drew has a secret talent of juggling flaming pineapples while singing opera? All right, he doesn't really, but that would be pretty impressive, wouldn't it? But if you really want to be impressed, take a look at Crystal. I've seen a ton of different solutions out there that do something maybe a little bit like this. And Drew and Crystal, they are the real deal. Absolutely. Learn more about both of them at crystalnose.com. As always, all links for everything we talked about, highlights, resources, full show notes are available at sassfuel.com. While you're there, be sure to subscribe, like, and follow the podcast. Everyone who subscribes this week will receive an unloaded subscription to the SAS Fuel Movie and Munch. It's a 10-minute training video for me that you can watch while you're eating a pizza. Probably won't win an Oscar, but it will up-level your business. So just drop me a message. Happy to send that over to you. Join us Thursday for our SaaS Fuel Expert Series with one of the greatest financial minds in SaaS today, the SaaS CFO. Ben Murray will be here 
to talk finances, metrics, exits, and much more. And then next Tuesday, our founder is Ibrahim Assam, founder and CEO of eCourtDate, a SaaS that makes our justice system more friendly, equitable, and efficient. This is one of those brilliant ideas that is so simple, you'll say, well, why didn't I think of that? And you know, when that happens, you know you're on the right track to a great solution. So be sure and check it out next week. And until then, enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to SaaS Fuel. Full show notes for each episode, which includes a summary, key takeaways, quotes, and any resources mentioned are available at sasfuel.com. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying the content and getting value from these episodes, please leave us a rating and review at ratethispodcast.com slash sasfuel. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes.